All right, so we're gonna talk about the biomedical approach to treatment and therapy. And largely when we're talking about biomedical, we're not talking about therapy at all, we're talking about biomedical treatment. So what do we mean by biomedical treatments? Well, we just saw the historical overview and really how that historical milestones took place was a lot of trial and error, especially in the discovery of medications and drugs used for psychotherapy. And it was the idea that mixing together some chemicals and seeing what happens was a lot of guessing games or even by accident in a lot of times. The how this evolved was really through understanding the connection between biological symptoms and mental health or vice versa, mental health and biological symptoms. And again, one of the big milestones that I do want you to know is the idea that one of the earliest settings was the fact that syphilis would cause tissue damage in the brain. You could actually see the brain turning color and starting to shrivel up due to untreated syphilis. Today, when we're talking about biomedical treatments, we're largely talking about how on a neuroscience level, there's a difference going on in one's brain anatomy, brain chemistry, or brain activity, and how that is biological so we can address this through biological means. Now we could really see how we are a biological species and how just doing everyday stuff in our everyday life, when we talked about in health psychology, like getting lots of sunshine, being in nature, relaxing, but also getting some exercise, that's a biomedical treatment. It's a non-clinical treatment in most cases, but that's the idea that you are taking care of your biological needs has to be underscored that we are a biological species. And so when things are darker or rainy out or colder, it does impact us on a psychological and biological level. So being sensitive to that is a really good step. But particularly when we talk about clinical psychology, we like to talk about brain stimulation as one of the techniques we use in the biomedical model. And so brain stimulation can take a couple different forms. In some types of brain stimulation, we're actually talking about reducing the stimulation. One type of brain reduction strategy was a lobotomy. And lobotomies became more popular in clinical psychology in the 1900s, but we have archeological records of lobotomies going back tens of thousands of years. We can find archeological skulls with holes drilled in them that appear to be lobotomies. And so lobotomy is the idea of either through laser or surgery or freezing, part of the brain becomes numb or inactive. You might actually remove parts of the brain. We can see this done in really severe cases of epilepsy where something has to be severed to reduce the amount of seizures. Uh, of course, lobotomies are often talked about in pop culture about removing part of the frontal brain and then somebody's not able to think to the same level. Lobotomies are much less common today than they were 100 years ago, and with good reason, there tends to be a lot of other things we can do that are less invasive. Another type of brain stimulation reduction we might do is sensory deprivation. This might be the idea of going into a float tank or going into a sensory deprivation chamber to calm the mind or to see what's going on in terms of brain activity. That is definitely possible as well. In addition to brain reduction, we might also do brain stimulation increase. And this could be when we send more signals to the brain to try and get the brain to wake up or be more active or active in a different way. Of course, one of the very main pop culture types of this that's often cited in movies is electric shock therapy. We know that 100 years ago, this could take a very aggressive, questionably ethical form. And this would be with a patient that's in an asylum or a mental health hospital held down. They have a bite plate they bite onto and there would be electrical impulses sent through their skull. Electric shock therapy went away and wasn't popular for many decades. It is making a comeback in a much more humane form. Electric shock therapy today involves a lot of consent, a lot more ethical prudence, and the idea that the patient or the client has control over it. So they administer the shocks, they have a little uh, controller or they have a little computer control where they can set up how the intensity of the shocks and when the shocks will start under supervision of care providers. So it is coming back in a much more safe and less shocking form. We also have lots of other approaches. We have the transcranial magnetic stimulation. What this is, is a magnetic coil that can be used, put near the head and can really uh, try to draw out and make the brain more active in certain ways. We also have vagus nerve stimulation. So the vagus nerve, if you took Psych 200, it is the longest nerve in the body. It runs from the back of the neck down around the aorta of the heart and back up at the chest. And this is a nerve that really fires when we have those heartwarming movements or, or we really feel it move when we're having a huge emotional reflex. 
we know through stimulating the vagus nerve, it can actually calm us down. And so there are simple little electrical devices that can get implanted under the skin or can be held next to the skin that when a client or patient administers it to themselves, they can, add, they can actually stimulate not the whole brain, but just the vagus nerve. And that can help with a lot of things like emotional um, mood disorders and like depression. And for individuals with really uh, resistant to treat depression, we have now gone back to something sort of similar to a lobotomy, but different, and this is called deep brain stimulation. And this is a modern technique where it's only done in absolutely extreme situations where some holes are drilled into the skull so we can put electrical sensors right on the brain to sensitize and increase stimulation in the brain. So why do we use these brain stimulation techniques? What are they used for? Well, historically we've used them for lots of things such as major depressive episodes, schizophrenia. Sometimes they were even used historically for when there was non-compliance or opposition in patients, however. Today we could really see them used for mood disorders or hallucination disorders, and that might be where they find the most usage. But there could be other possibilities as well. Now, aside from brain stimulation, another big part of the biomedical model is medication. Now there's some areas where we want to talk about less medication like detoxing and that may be the case if we're looking at someone with a substance addiction for instance or in many cases before we can treat their underlying mental health concern we have to make sure they sober up first. So absolutely detoxing and helping someone to uh, safely rehabilitate and sober up might be very part of might be a huge part of the biomedical model but then we also have the addition of medications and there's been a lot of really interesting uh, improvements in medications in the last 60 years in mental health. They come in different classes of drugs, and if you did take Psych 200, this might be a little bit of a refresher for you. But we have some anti-anxiety sedatives, and these come in two main schools, benzodiazepines and barbiturates. These can really numb the nervous system. It makes things more quiet. They're often considered downers. And barbiturates are a bit more harsh, but we still see them used in some things like post-traumatic stress disorder or dissociative disorder. And barbiturates are often called in pop culture truth serums. And they're not actually truth serums, but what they do is they make someone feel less nervous and they're more likely to relax and feel comfortable talking about something that might be really, really upsetting to them. So if you're trying to get at someone to talk about their past trauma or to talk about something that they won't open up about, a barbiturate can help them feel more at ease in opening up. A benzodiazepam doesn't necessarily make you feel more at ease at opening up, but it helps you to relax. And so this school of drug can be used if somebody's having a panic attack, for instance. It can help to calm the arousal level. Now, importantly, there are some negative effects associated with these anti-anxiety sedatives. They are quick acting, which is good. However, they're also only last a certain amount of time. And so they act quickly, but they leave the body pretty quickly in about a day or so. And they come with lots of withdrawal effects. Even taking one benzodiazepam for one panic attack, the very next day, a person can feel even more panicky or even more on edge than they were before. So it comes with some nasty withdrawal effects. You're not supposed to take benzodiazepines over the long term unless it's closely supervised and with good communication with the healthcare provider. And because these can become rapidly, rapidly addictive. And addictions to benzodiazepines can be quite severe. Now, although the benzodiazepines and barbiturates are called anti-anxiety sedatives, we also know that anxiety disorders can be very well treated with antidepressants. And so antidepressants can be used to treat anxiety disorders, including uh, panic disorder, social anxiety, generalized anxiety, it can also be used to treat things like post-traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and lots of personality disorders. So it is a bit of a misnomer. So antidepressants have evolved in the last 60 years with lots of different types. The original types were called MAO inhibitors and they would attempt to adjust the level of activity in the brain. We moved away from them for the most part, though they can still be used in some cases. Tricyclics were the second case of antidepressants. And what they did is they really changed how serotonin was released in the brain, but sort of just uniformly. Tricyclics led to some severe side effects in some patients because there's just too much serotonin. And then we moved on to selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. That was really our third generation and it seemed to get it right in most cases. Now for some people that there is some still negative side effects of their SSRIs and we are working with some additional types of antidepressants nowadays called SNRIs. Rather than working on serotonin, these are working on norepinephrine. So they are selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. 
And I don't want you to know these four classes of antidepressants too much in detail, but just know that the first one was the MAO inhibitors. And today, most people are most likely to get prescriptions for SSRIs or SNRIs, but you may still get a prescription for a tricyclic or an MOA inhibitor if you're looking at that. Antidepressants tend to be taken long term, and if you go to withdrawal from them, it has to be done very gradually over weeks or even months. Uh, but if you need to take them long term, you can take them for years of your life or even much longer than that. And they tend to be something that doesn't have a huge addiction property to it. But when you go to stop, you should make sure you tell everyone and, and do it extremely gradually. The next type of drug that we're going to talk about is mood stabilizers. These are almost always used for bipolar disorder. And what happens here is rather than giving someone with bipolar disorder an antidepressant, which could lead them to having a manic or hypomanic episode, these mood stabilizers keep them between the zones of depression and mania and helps them stay in that moderate zone. Then we have the antipsychotics. Antipsychotics tend to be used for individuals with uh, schizophrenia or who are experiencing psychosis associated with bipolar or even some people with epilepsy or other types of conditions. Antipsychotics really work to numb the brain and reduce the amount of hallucinations and delusions one experiences. And so it's really more of an antagonist to our antidepressants. Just want to shout out there that if you have need for antidepressants and antipsychotics in your life, perhaps you have depression and schizophrenia, that should really be clearly talked about with a healthcare provider because taking an antipsychotic can exacerbate the symptoms of depression and taking an antidepressant can actually exacerbate the symptoms of schizophrenia. So just something to be wary of. So with antipsychotics, there's been a couple generations. They tend to have some really intense side effects, but it's important to understand we have to weigh the cost benefits and most of the time there's a huge benefit to staying on antipsychotics. We also have things like stimulants. These include Adderall or Ritalin, and they typically are used for people with an ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. However, they may be used for other off-label uses as well. More new to Canada is the use of psychedelics like LSD or psychedelic mushrooms. These have been found to treat things like depression and addictions. And so psychedelics, they last in your system for a long time. Um, and so what happens here is just one dosage may be in your system a very active for up to two days, but then you can even have psychedelic flashbacks generations after you take it. And so this absolutely should be done with caution and under care of a health provider. And we're really just starting to make headways in how we're using that clinically uh, even this year. And then finally, I want to talk about the antiandrogens. What these do is they reduce the amount of androgen hormones or like testosterone in one system. These can be beneficial when we think about some sex disorders or paraphilias, as well as some personality disorders like antisocial personality disorder. It lowers the competitive dominance. Uh, there is some ethical concerns about how those are used and if the patients are in full agreement of using them, of course. It's important to understand that lots of people try to self-medicate sometimes, whether that's through alcohol or cannabis, and although that can have an impact on you, that shouldn't be used without talking to a healthcare provider. We know that some individuals use alcohol the way we use an anti-anxiety sedative, for instance, to numb the brain, take the edge off. Just like benzodiazepines, that could be very addictive and could have very extreme withdrawal effects if somebody is binge drinking on a regular basis. We also know that sometimes cannabis is used as an anti-anxiety sedative, especially the CBD approaches to it. It's very prudent to try and talk to your healthcare provider about that if you are using marijuana for a medical purpose.